welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. With me today is John Cameron. And we had an, me and Richard Fields had an opportunity to sit down with Janice Bonzer, a candidate for the 6th Assembly District here in Sacramento, California. And we're going to take you to that interview here now in a minute. Um, it was a good, we had a chance to sit down for about 20 minutes. And I think this is about an eight minute, I think we made an eight minute clip. And it, we had a chance to talk about gun control, hemp, and why she ran, why she decided to go ahead and run for, for the assembly. She is a, a chronic candidate. She runs whenever she feels the whenever she feels the need. She has run a number of uh, can, uh, campaigns, mm -hmm. and this is the first time she's run in this district due to the uh, recent change in how the assembly districts mm -hmm. have been. Uh, Reconfigured. Recent gerrymandering, you mean? Yeah, ger gerrymandering. Yeah, this the uh, named after Jerry Brown. No, not really. No, no. All right, and uh, so this is um, me, Mr. Richard Fields, and Janice Bonzer. Janice, so why did you decide to run? Libertarians are against all wars. We are in favor of peace. We're, as far as I can tell, we're the only have that on our platform. It's it's very important to me that we have peace and that we don't have war. Have to start scripting As a account. matter of fact, so can the I things just that the libertarians account? love best are private property Seven and, and trading, which always brings peace. And in order to have, um, in order to trade, we need to have private property. And this really excels the, our health and our well-being because the more we trade, the more private property we create. And the more private property we create, the more we can trade. And so it keeps going on and on until we are all very wealthy. And just the opposite is true. When we tax people, it actually creates wars, especially sanctions create wars. And so basically, because I love peace so much, and because I love people so much, because I want us to all thrive and be well, that's why I'm a libertarian. You're running uh, for assembly in California. What, what are the, I, I know that uh, uh, marijuana uh, and uh, industrial hemp and so forth have always have been a, a, a driving force for you for as long as I've known you, many, many years. Uh, is that still the case? Are you still uh, working on those issues? And uh, uh, what needs to be done in California? As you know, um, President Obama, when he was president, uh, signed the um, Hemp Farmers Act bill, which sounds so good. I was so happy, but it's riddled with uh, regulations and license fees and taxes so much that hemp farmers are not wanting to grow it. It's not the billion dollar crop as popular mechanics described it when a machine was just invented. A machine had just been invented in 1937 and it harvested hemp and popular mechanics and mechanical engineering both talked about what a great crop that is and that it's worth um, mechanical engineering called it the most profitable crop that can be grown and popular mechanics called hemp the new billion dollar crop all because a machine had been invented. However, then came the Marijuana Tax Act, and also because so it's a machine and the farmers were poor, and then we had all these regulations against it, and so we didn't so we're, we're, have the billion dollar crop, and we still this. don't because of all the regulations. In California, especially, the, we have legal marijuana, but it's, easy, it's, it's now easier to be a marijuana criminal than it used to be. Because you used to have to actually go out your way to become a marijuana criminal. Now you can try to become, you can try to have a legal business and end up being a marijuana criminal. And, and all the regulations and the taxes. And so it's actually still cheaper to buy, to buy the marijuana from the drug dealer than it is to go into the store, which was the whole point, right? Was to make it cheap enough to go into the store. And they've even destroyed that. Taxes always destroy everything, and including peace. Hey, I'm just going by we have to be right against so. taxes <laughs> and regulations and license fee if yeah. we want peace. But we're so used to taxes, and we're so used to war. Uh, America's in 99 wars right now. <laughs> Only six of them volatile. Hemp is different from marijuana. And um, it, we used to name our state New York, Hemp Dead Pennsylvania. 
Hempstead, Arkansas. And there's even a Hempstead here in Sacramento, uh, Hempstead Drive. I'm right on Morrison, Morrison Avenue, Morrison, Hempstead. The thing is, it used to be the standard, and that's all messed up. Nobody recognizes hemp anymore, to confuse it with marijuana. And that was the same thing that happened in 1937. Yeah, and you're talking about regulations. Um, we're living in California. We'll switch to housing real quick. Um, we're living in, we okay. live in Sacramento. We and I both live in Sacramento. And we know it costs the average of $90,000 for a permit, just the permit to build a house. And so when your house is three, you buy your new house for $400,000, $100,000 that goes to the government just for permits, which also has the, the, the secondary effect of increasing property values, which means they get to have increased property taxes every year over the course of the time. And so it's this, it's this uh, shell game, essentially, that they've created amongst themselves. Now, how do, as a state assembly person, how would you kind of go about that? Would you fight for a law to reduce the, the permitting fees or something like that to help actually create affordable housing without having the government get involved? That sounds like a great idea. I didn't know it was a problem do, doing that. I know that there's other problems regarding home ownership. Um, not, I, I only, um, so I don't really have a solution, but that solution sounds pretty good. What I do know is that um, there is code enforcement that was voted unanimously. They invented a code enforcement personnel who comes to your home and will count your home as a rental housing unit. And then if, if you have a friend there who takes out the garbage once in a while, and then they call that a consideration. Um, it's a way that people lose their homes. It's because um, the code man can say anything he wants and, and it, can, it, it counts as truth until you can uh, appeal it. And you, could, you can also make it so the appeal um, is too late. And so I've seen um, houses on the news that look like are very nice, but they're being sold from the owners under protest because the code man has been there. I, I think that we're fighting the government from every angle. I think that they're trying to take our homes in any way they can and make us just rent um, because it's more profitable for them. As far as the, the problem about um, getting a permit, we used to never get permits for anything. We could have um, build our own home, own a gun. So there has been 27 shootings um, nationwide and um, mostly with uh, assault r rifles. And I was thinking about that and about how we don't want regulations and we don't want um, licensees and, and that um, as a good libertarian, I have been always voting no on all of those things. However, I think I will vote yes on some regulations regarding assault weapons, even though that's not very libertarian. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, sometimes no, you can be libertarian and just be a little bit um, Democrat. No, well, it's not even, you know, you're libertarians. We're allowed to not agree on 100% of everything, right? We're allowed to disagree and have disagreements and still be friendly and, 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 and kind to each other, right? That's the whole yeah. point of being libertarians. You can actually disagree and still be friendly and kind and compassionate okay. with each other. Your district is actually quite supportive of more gun regulations. So it's not, you're not actually out of step with the people of your district. I, I know the people of your district. I, I asked to support them. You know, that was a disagreement we had. So you're actually in agreement with your people of your district. And there's nothing wrong with that as a libertarian, as any politician, right? Your job is to help your, your people be heard. And so there's nothing wrong with, with, uh, I just felt in my heart. That's the way I want to vote. All right. And we wish Janice the best of luck in Bonzer. her Janice Bonzer. Yes. Janice Bonzer. Best of luck in her, uh, run for assembly. And, and you know, it's a, a good point out that libertarians aren't this, you know, single mindset on any issue. We all have a wide range of, of beliefs and a wide variety of, of thought processes and how we get there. And so it's good to be able to hear this. And it's also good for, for us to have a representative mindset where mm -hmm. we're not so 
so steadfast in our in our beliefs mm -hmm. that we forget that when we're running for public office that our our job is to actually to try to represent the whole community mm -hmm. not just mm -hmm. represent the um the narrow perspectives mm -hmm. of a libertarian activist or mm -hmm. even a libertarian voter mm -hmm. but as politicians we're supposed to represent everybody yeah yeah so which is virtually impossible to do but you know that's the thing the, the old joke is you don't uh you don't ever want uh, two libertarians to speak uh, at an event because they'll be diametrically opposed to what the other person <laughs> says. And that's, you know, when, when you look at it, like, like Janice was talking about, you know, assault weapons. And while, while we were watching that, uh, the doctor and I were, were kind of chatting quietly in the background. And, and the, the weapons that they choose to call assault weapons are, are the most popular, most prevalent uh, self-defense weapons in the country, you can defend the heck out of a home with one of those things. And, um, and it's the, the, the most popular sporting arm for people hunting, varmint shooting, depend, defending their livestock, target shooting, all the rest of that. It's the one they're trained on. So, you know, trying to, uh, to make the, the, uh, the most popular and, and prevalent weapon in the United States illegal is, is, uh, is a failure from day one. And, uh, you know, again, guns are easy to make. You know, the yeah. Russians the Russians designed some beautiful weapons of war that could be made in a standard machine shop 60 years ago. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a hopeless cause. But, uh, you know, as we talked about in the, in, in the, uh, in the. Next show. As, as we talked about in the next show. <laughs> uh, criminals will always find a way to get guns. But if an armed citizen uh, resists them with a completely uh, legal firearm, chances are they're going to back down. They're not out there to commit suicide. If they were, they would turn the gun on themselves before they left their house. So, yeah. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. So we, we wish her luck. And we wish all libertarians who are running for office luck. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, we wish all candidates who mm -hmm. take it seriously, mm -hmm. who actually approach the... the uh, mm -hmm the prospect with a representative mindset, I personally wish all of them luck. Mm -hmm. And so, but the person who I don't wish luck is Janet Yellen. She finally came across this week and has admitted that she was wrong last year on the paths to U.S. inflation, mm. which of course we pointed out two years ago that this inflation was coming down the pipe. Well, I think we actually pointed out about six years ago when they started printing money. Yeah, but, but we guaranteed that it was going to happen <laughs> a couple of years ago when they started printing money like, Crazy. While restricting economic activity. So you mm -hmm. couldn't even mm -hmm. have the economic, economic activity to kind of balance it out. They and restricted putting, economic putting, activity. putting money not just in the hands of banksters and rich folks, but giving consumers on the street, you know, people who are used to making, you know, $30,000, telling them they don't have to pay rent, they don't have to pay their student loans, and here's in, in tax-free money we're printing, here's twice the money, or 1.6 times the money you were earning at your job, oh, well, what are you going to do? You're going to spend it. And, and, and if you can't produce stuff because the economy shut down and you want to go buy stuff, what's going to happen? The price of stuff's going to go up because there are going to be more dollars chasing fewer things. And it's the, literally the only thing that can happen. And then who gets rich? It's the Amazons and the Walmarts and the Targets of the because world. Because they shut down. They were necessary. Whereas all these small businesses, which are the lifeblood of this country, that went out of business, I don't know, a million of them will never come back. Um, you know, they were deemed unnecessary. So, um, yeah, anybody who... Uh, and what's the name of that quack? And he won a Nobel Prize. And Nobel... Uh, uh, dear viewers, uh, is code for socialist. Uh, anybody who wins any kind of Nobel Prize, uh, basically there are people who tow the party line of uh, the bureaucratic interventionist state. And uh, he was talking about, oh, no, inflation isn't called, caused by mass money supply. It's greedy businesses, uh, price, price gouging, and da-da-da-da. Uh, Mr. Greedy. Krugman you're talking about again. Yeah. Krugman? Paul? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Krugman. Yes, yes, yes. It's the greedy businesses. Well, the businesses are always greedy, and they're always the same greedy. They're Everybody's not, uh, greedy. They're but not see, magically more Mr. greedy Krugman, now. Mr. Krugman, let me explain something to you. <laughs> <laughs> if one greedy business charges too much and an un another greedy business charges slightly less, then people are going to leave 
greedy business number one that charges more and go buy essentially the same product for less. And so what greedy business number one is going to do is they don't want to lose all their market share, so they're going to lower their prices to try to get get business back from business number two. But then number two doesn't want to, uh, so they're either going to provide better service, better quality, or lower prices, and on and on and on. And it's a race to the bottom in prices when it's competitive in a marketplace and a race to the top in service and quality when it's competitive in the marketplace. But when the government gets involved and just prints money and says, you can only do business here, or you can only do business there, or because of archaic rules, no, you can't make baby formula in this plant until we send our bureaucrats out to test it, and that takes a year, then you have problems. So, you know, we predicted all of this. We, I think we actually guaranteed it. I was willing to make bets uh, and did with a little bit of my money. So um, they're wrong. They were lying. They know they're lying. But Yellen's the only one that came out so far and said I was wrong. Yeah, and, and the, the unintended consequences that we've kind of predicted, right? The UN is now warning of crippling global food shortages mm. because of the, the, the high food prices. And they're going to blame Ukraine for the wheat. And okay, fair enough, Ukraine and Russia are like 25% of the world's wheat. But mm. wheat can be produced in six months, mm. right? The farmers, months. Can, farmers can plant wheat and you can produce more wheat. There's winter wheat, which yeah. takes a little longer. You can, I mean, if they turn the spigot on for the water in California... California could produce enough wheat to feed the world pretty darn quickly. Um, but they're, because the, the uh, fisher bees, no, they're not fisher bees. They're the, they're the little tiny fish that actually aren't even native California. We're pumping 40% of the water out into, or 50% of the water out into the, uh, the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so, you know, we could have taken up probably half of that slack. I mean... California farmers are, are crazy good at producing crops. So all they need is a little water and for the government to get out of the way. And they love their soil, so they're not going to hurt it long term. That would just be crazy. That would be like shooting your car when you need to take it somewhere. You know? Yeah, so. and actually what we've learned is, is technology has been able to reclaim essentially some land that was, was salting. Mm-hmm. And so we've actually learned how to kind of fix the land mm-hmm. by planting different crops, yeah. rotating crop yeah. rotations yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and the various things. We've actually learned how to do it better, how to, to preserve the, the land mm-hmm. and how to make the land last longer, how mm-hmm. to make wider variety of crops. Mm-hmm. And they're learning and we're sharing this knowledge ar- mm-hmm. around the world. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, what California does, what we learn how to do with managing our water, becoming mm-hmm. more water res- resilient, becoming... Um, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? A better steward of the environment mm-hmm. and making it last longer is that that greed is mm-hmm. actually what does it because the farmer wants to be able to farm his land for longer and generations. Longer. Yeah, it, it farmers does. love their land, folks. The idea that that these uh, factory farms are evil is just crazy. That's propaganda. And we have we have a farmer regularly on the show. Just imagine Richard Fields sitting right there, being tall and not nearly as pretty as me, and. Um, <laughs> Uh, he he made some points that that you know when he was first farming. Oh, back in his youth, that would have been in eighteen. No, it wouldn't have been in eighteen something. It'd be like I don't know, fifty years ago when he was working on the family farm. That that uh, because of improvements in crops and soil soil utilization, and uh, because of GMO and because of better insecticides, they basically touched the soil twice. You used to touch it five or six times. So soil erosion is basically gone. You get four times the productivity out of the soil for basic crops like wheat that you used to. So this Malthusian concept that, you know, the world's going to starve to death if you just get out of the way and, and let people uh, put a desalinization, is that the right word? Yep. Plant in Southern California right next to the nuke that I hope we keep open and the other nukes that we open. Um be heaven on earth folks and if they hadn't have taken all that water remember we got rain in october and so they they took their algorithm to say oh it's going to be a wet year even though they predicted a drought they let all that water go out in the ocean they emptied out the all of these uh um the um reservoirs so and then it didn't rain from the rest of the year so the government screwed up again people imagine that I think we should just call them screw-ups instead of government. Yeah, well, you know, the central planners, they, they always yeah. think, well, it, it, this is the way it is, so it's going to continue. Mm. 
and, but it never continues because no. life isn't like that. You should have seen my hair when I was a young man, folks. <laughs> it didn't continue. No. But what could we have done? You know, when we talk about recent school shootings, and I can't pronounce this. this Uvalde. Uvalde? Uvalde or Uvalde. Uvalde? Yeah. I can't yeah. pronounce that, that yeah. word. You know, every, we all my viewers know my, me and pronunciations. Um, <laughs> so the government sat there for, what is it now, 77 minutes yeah. while this, this kid was in there shooting up the school, mm-hmm. and they sat outside for 77 minutes yeah. protecting failure themselves. After failure after failure after failure after failure. Teacher propped the door open. Um, or not. Uh, there's, they, there's, they've, yeah, they've changed they, that, whether they, they have or uh, not. It's, it's they, they didn't do what they were supposed to do, which is just assault the place right away. They wanted to wait for backup. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm actually surprised in Texas that one of those teachers wasn't armed. Uh, maybe this, there are places in Texas where they don't allow teachers to be armed on campus. There are other places in the country uh, where they allow uh, school employees to pack. And, and I'm not saying I would guarantee it, but I'm saying that if, if, if every other teacher in that school had a concealed weapon and nobody knew which teacher had it in her purse or in the small of her back, uh, crazy kid would have been um, a little less likely to go into that school. Yeah. And, and the guy was obviously nuts, and, uh, but you know, failure after failure after failure, the, 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 the mass shooting in, um, in uh, Florida, they had an armed um, cop uh, um, on campus who decided not to go in. And, and because of the terms of his contract, he was supposed to go in, but he wasn't required to go in. Um, so every time you look at these, these mass shootings that they say there's thousands of, but they're uh, school shootings, I think there's been school mass shootings, 27 since 1967. Most of the things they talk of as mass shootings are actually gang warfare. The thing that happened here in Sacramento wow. that they labeled um, um, uh, a mass shooting was actually gang warfare. And, and um, there was, in, either in Stockton or in Sacramento, there was 50 shootings as a result of a shooting five or six years ago because it was people trying to get even. And so, you know, there's lots of disinformation and misinformation, but, you know, as long as, um, you know, the, the, the um, lamestream media makes such a big deal about this, and as long as um, there are lunatics in the world, um, occasionally kids are going to get shot. Yeah. But I would say flat out, fewer kids will get shot if teachers are armed. And people will call me some kind of right-wing lunatic for that. But tell me another solution that works. You, this, this guy got a gun, and if he couldn't have got one illegally, he would have bought one out of the back of a truck. There was lots of signals, and they could have red flagged him, but that's suspicious anyway, and mostly just neighbors ratting out neighbors. So the one thing that would have worked is somebody meeting an armed person with arms. Well, and I think that's that one it. of the failures here is the unintended consequence of the militarization of police. They sat around, and they waited for their tactical unit to show mm-hmm. up. That's what they were waiting for. Mm-hmm. They wanted their they wanted their armed vehicle and the mm-hmm. and their SWAT their tank team and their and tactical their SWAT unit. Team and, yeah. and so, as this emergency is going on, they're they're sitting around waiting rather than doing what kicking the door in rather than responding. Shooting the door in, yeah. 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 Rather yeah. than responding, and Take, that's taking one for the team, folks. And yeah. it's a lack of leadership. It's just a complete and total lack of leadership. Is where everybody. It's, it's not my responsibility. It's somebody else's. Yeah. Yeah. And because we've militarized the police, that the officer on the ground it's no longer his job Mm. and i was telling p someone the other day is you know in the last 10 15 years officer safety has become job one but if officer safety is job one public safety can be no higher than job two Mm. and that's Mm. what we've seen here is is public safety was not job one in this case it clearly was not job one officer safety was and children suffered because of it yeah and i think if if you want to see something quite amusing that i only had a chance to glance at Reason has a thing where uh, a uh, a little puppet is talking to a a comic book cop about the 10 facts about the police that you'll find interesting. And, and, you know, officer safety is quite high on the list. Uh, uh, Being a cop is uh, not the most dangerous job in this country, despite all the violence out there. It's the 12th most dangerous job in the country. And I'm not saying cops should martyr themselves left and right, but they should martyr themselves. Um, that's their job. 
and and their job is to serve and protect. It's not to keep order. Uh, it's to serve and protect. And sometimes that that demands sacrifice. If it was in the military, uh, I will I will guarantee, despite the fact that the military is a huge bureaucracy, some low level sergeant would have said, "Follow me," and gone through that door. Uh, I will guarantee that because they realize that it is their job on occasion to die for their country. And um, I think it's the cops' jobs when kids' lives are on the line to um, take a risk with their own, and I don't think there's any other way to put it. No, well, we firefighters will run into a burning building to save your life, mm. and why can't we expect the same thing from a police officer? They're supposed to be trained for that, and if we don't train them properly, we don't train the ground-level mm. police op properly mm. to respond, well, then that's a training issue, and we need to deal with that. But this is a colossal failure. Life is failure. a training issue, and we got a lot of things to fix, bro. Let me <laughs> we, tell we've you. got a lot of them. Yeah. And speaking of a lot of them, housing is overvalued. It's uh, some magical study now it came out. The guy is in, what is this, Forbes or whatever. And housing is overvalued, so a reckoning in the market it could be on the way. And mm. analyst warns, of course, right? Mm. And analyst warns. Like, what? Of course, if you live in California, you know this. You're living at the edge of a ghetto, and your house is now $500,000, and you're going, how is this possible? Well, you can live in a ghetto and have your house be $500,000. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm – uh, yeah, there, there's uh, – you know, every time there's a bubble, the, the people in who sell real estate and invest in real estate – and by the way, the government always bails them out. The government meaning you and I, folks – Maybe next time we'll talk about student loan bailout. That's just immoral and unconscionable. But every time you get, we get into one of these bubbles, people talk about why it's different. And it's never different. I mean, houses are crazy overpriced. Uh, you've had people chasing houses and bidding them up astronomically, and, and housing prices are going to go down. When mortgage rates become more in line with reality, you know, before... Uh, your mortgage cost you less than the rate of inflation. So you were basically getting free money and then some to buy an overpriced house. Now mortgages are still only about half the rate of the current horrible inflation that Janet Yellen was wrong about. Again, let's just rub that rubber face in that. Um, it's still got to be overpriced. I mean, if, if you can borrow money to buy a house for, what, 5% now, 4%, and inflation is at at least nine percent, then you're still using house money, and so, um, you know, it's, something's got to give, and and that's going to be housing prices, and we've all known that. We've how many times have we watched this roller coaster in California? I lived in Sacramento and bought my nice little condo on the river, at one of the crashes, and. You know, and, and every time housing prices go up, I try to talk my wife into selling and buying the house back later for less, and I can never talk her into it, and it happens. I don't know exactly when it's going to happen, folks, but it always happens. It always happens. Well, it, it, and, they, and they set it up for it. Like here in Sacramento, the rail yards, right, the, this whole big rail yards mm -hmm. development, they've built the streets, they put all, everything, all the utilities are set. All they literally, all they have to do is build houses, mm -hmm. and it's been sitting empty for a decade. Mm -hmm. And that's a choice because the powers that be wanted to uh, have a soccer stadium or something development, mm -hmm. want to have to mm -hmm. control the development rather than just parcel out, sell the lands out to parcel to small and medium developers and let it get built mm -hmm. at housing at market rates, which would have, which would have reduced the demand of houses in my neighborhood. So my house would have been worse left, worse le worth, worth less, less, but yet the, <laughs> the worth a little less, not worth worthless. a little less. Yeah. But the, the neighborhood wouldn't have been destroyed. All the people who have been forced out because they can no longer afford rent or all the people who have been forced out because the economics, you have to sell it. There comes a point where sometimes mm -hmm. the economics... Take the, the money and run, folks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and yeah. they leave the state. We're, we're ripping the hearts out of our communities because yeah. of this. Mm -hmm. And the unintended consequences, we're just ignoring. We're just completely I think, ignoring. I think we should just have an I told you so day here. One time we should just pick everything out of everything out of the front page of... The things they used to call newspapers that was like seven pages long the other day. And we should just do, I told you so, I told you so, I told you so, and put the date where we told people in there. Because we knew this date was coming. And, you know, everybody screams about schools not having enough money, lie, 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 lie. And we need to raise property taxes. Well, the reason they put Prop 13 in is that widows 
were being forced out of their homes because they couldn't pay property taxes. That's the reason it was put in there. That's the reason you don't have house price appreciation in states like New Jersey, where you're spending $12,000 a year in property tax on a $250,000 house. So you get what you ask for, you get what you pay for, you get what you're put up with. Yeah, it's... And the thing is, it's sad. You know, we've got another minute and a half, so I don't want to jump into another story. Um, sure, let's go for it. But it's, we don't have time. Not the next the stories, we don't have time. So <laughs> we went over. Um, but it's sad that we're watching these, our communities get destroyed. You know, and part of this community's being destroyed is we're watching this, the violence. We talk about violence. And we're, what, why is that? It's because our communities are falling apart. Our, stru- our family structures are falling apart. They're the roots the very fundamental roots you know when you have people who've lived in whose families have lived in a house for 20 50 generations generations yeah. that's actual roots that hold the soil of that community together yeah. and when you're ripping those things up you're literally you're literally destroying like a garden like you know like anything else when you rip things up you're just you're not doing good for these communities you're not doing good for society and we talk about greed but who is the greediest person throughout all of history mm-hmm. it's not businesses it's government. Mm-hmm. And we want to thank you for joining us here on Libertarian Counterpoint. John, thank you for being with us. Thank you very and much thank for you having all me for on the show. Us. And please remember to love everybody and good night. Yeah.